Revelation chapter 11 is by far my favorite chapter in the book of Revelation. The reason for that is not just because I am a Jew, that's part of it, but it's because of God's plan for the Jewish people. Let me start in Romans chapter 11. So you can always remember this, Romans 11, Revelation 11. And put those two chapters together. Romans 11, verse 25. Paul says, For I do not want you, brethren, and you can include cistern, to be uninformed of the mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles had come in. What happened was a lot of the Gentiles were pretty proud that God had opened the door to them and they thought for sure that God was punishing the Jews and they were, you know, they were toast. Paul says in verse 26, and thus all Israel will be saved just as it is written. I believe that Revelation 11 comes at a wonderful time. It's one of those pauses. It's be the pause between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. After the seventh trumpet, I mean the rest of Revelation takes off like a rocket. The bold judgments, when they're pulled out, they, 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 when they fall out, they come out really fast. We have some other interludes and things to pull everything together. But once that seventh trumpet sounds, I mean, things really get rocking and rolling. Verse chapter 11 comes at a time that is so important from your handout. Verse 1, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. This is uh, an angel uh, to John. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God the altar and those who worship there but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given to the gentiles and they will tread the holy city under foot for 42 months or three and a half years let me read the first the next two verses verse three and four and i will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth verse four these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the god of the earth if you notice on letter A, number one, there are five temples. I've listed them there. The temple of Solomon, Zerubbabel, Herod, the tribulation temple, and the millennial temple. John was called to measure the temple. This would be the tribulation temple. We know in 70 AD that Herod's temple was destroyed. So this temple, we're pretty clear that after the rapture of the church, the Antichrist, somewhere maybe even before the rapture, begins to initiate peace with Israel. Somewhere the rapture takes place, everybody that's not a believer, that didn't like Christians in the first place, they're probably pretty happy. But the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel. It's a covenant that, that essentially brings peace to the whole world. All of us in our lifetimes, we have heard nothing but the lack of peace and the propoundance, propoundance of war over Israel. Israel was always, has always been the center of conflict the center of pain. So many people would like to see Israel just wiped off the map. And yet this 
Antichrist makes peace for the first time. The world is ecstatic. Israel and the rest of the world at peace? Come on! Who in the world could accomplish that? When John is called to measure the city, it's important to understand that if the temple is rebuilt, and the temple could be, be, be rebuilt pretty fast, where was that temple rebuilt? Certainly it couldn't be rebuilt on the mosque where Muhammad took off in his horse and went to heaven, the Dome of the Rock. Even with the peace that the Antichrist brings, that's unthinkable. Probably what happens is in 1983, and since then, much research has been done on where Temple Mount really was. Archaeology Review did a, several articles that probably a hundred yards from the Dome of the Rock is the real Temple Mount. I can see that the anti-crime, the, I mean, the anti-crime, right, the Antichrist comes and he says, we're going to build a wall. Mosque over here, temple over here, and the Jews set up sacrifices again. And it becomes a great rejoicing for the nation of Israel. So John says you're to measure the temple, but not the outer court, because that's where the Dome of the Rock would be. That's where the Gentiles, the pagans, the non-believers. Now, I've enjoyed doing this study in Revelation. I've got about seven sources that I trust, both, both written and some that uh, I listen to their messages. And out of all the sources that I dip into besides my own study, seldom is there ever a Sunday I come here to the pulpit that all of those seven sources agree on the text that I'm going to preach on. There is so much disagreement uh, and different understanding when it comes to the book of Revelation. Now, verse 1 and 2, there's two camps. One camp feels that John is to measure the temple for judgment. The other camp is John is measuring it because God has given his grace to the Jewish people. I like the second view the best. All through the book of Revelation, God is giving grace to those that would repent and hear. If you don't make it in the rapture and you and your friends end up in the tribulation, it's not over. You have the 144,000 witnessing. You have the angels circling the earth. You have the rest that are born again preaching the word of God. Yeah, it's going to be bad, but it's not too late. You can receive Christ as your personal Savior. The two witnesses are fun to look at. Look at verse 3 and 4 again, and I will give power to, power to my two witnesses. They will prophesy. That means they're going to preach for three and a half years. Years. They're clothed in sackcloth, a sign of, of mourning, suffering, repentance, all of the sadness. In the Old Testament, people put on sackcloth because they were usually mourning. Verse 4 is intriguing. I want to look at this from the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, because it ties together so well what's taking place. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of, this, God of the earth. One of the reasons a lot of people feel that the two witnesses are Joshua, not Joshua who wrote the book of Joshua, but Joshua the priest, the high priest. Many feel because of Zechariah 4 that these two witnesses are Joshua and Zerubbabel. Let me read it to you from chapter 4. Uh, then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep and said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand. 
all of the gold with this bowl on the top of it and it's seven lamps on it and seven sprouts or spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on it so here's a menorah Zechariah sees this vision verse 3 also I'm in Zechariah 4 verse 3 also two olive trees by it one on the right side and the other on the left side. So here are these two olive trees behind, beside these two lampstands. Verse 4. Then I answered and said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not what the, what these are? Verse 6. Then he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by my might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now that's a verse that's often quoted. And it's to signify that Zerubbabel and Joshua are used in the building or the rebuilding of Solomon's temple that was destroyed. This is the temple of Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah prophecies, all of this has been, been, been done not by the strength and the power of the people, but by the strength and the power of the Spirit of God. The prophecy was both near and far. So many Old, Tost Old Testament prophets spoke about prophecy that had a near-term fulfillment and a long-term fulfillment. Zechariah 4 is exactly right. Near-term fulfillment, the temple was constructed. Long-term fulfillment, this speaks directly to Revelation chapter 11. Let's pick it up at verse 5. <laughs> and take a look at these guys. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with all the plagues as often as they desire. Now, I did a lot of ministering in my early life as a believer on Cal State Long Beach. I was a student there involved with Campus Crusade for Christ. And so I'm dealing with skeptics all the time. College kids are tough to deal with. If you've ever been in college, you know that. <laughs> I used to dream about having this power. How many of you, when you're witnessing to somebody, maybe a family member that's particularly stubborn, contentious and you could just jack them 50 feet up in the air and say you don't believe in the power of God watch it poof put them up in the air for about 10 minutes you know let fire come out of your mouth burn a few chairs in the living room See, God was smart enough not to give me this power. <laughs> you know, James and, James and John, the sons of thunder, that's what they wanted to do. When they were kicked out of one of the cities, they went to Jesus and said, can we call fire down from heaven? People of flesh, we understand this. But this is an end time event in the middle of the seven years of the tribulation. I believe this all takes place at the three and a half year point. And these two witnesses are released. Who are they? I believe they're Moses and Elijah. They are there in the spirit of Zerubbabel and Joshua, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy back then. That's why that's included in verse 4. But look at verse 6 at their power to shut up heaven. 
Elijah, guess what? He shut up heaven. For how long? Three and a half years. No rain fell. And remember Elijah, the king, sent 50 guys to talk to him and bring him back. What did Elijah do? Boom. Sent down fire from heaven. All 50 were wiped out. Sent another 50, the same thing. Fire came down from heaven upon the altar. Elijah is a great candidate because of the type of his prior ministry. And then going on in verse 6, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth. So, so here's the picture. Elijah holds the rain back so the waters are drying up and the water that's left Moses can turn it into blood. I mean, this is a miserable three and a half years. There's a lot of misery already in the tribulation period. The people of the earth hate these two witnesses. And they can't kill them. I love it. Until verse 7. And when they finish their testimony... I love verse 7. I wished I had learned this early on in my ministry in my life. There's a time when your ministry comes to an end. There's a time when you need to move to another house, another country, another city. A time to move to heaven. <laughs> Their ministry was finished. They weren't allowed to be killed until they had finished their work. Now, since I'm recording this, I'm not going to name names. There's several in you, several in our room today who are in active ministry. You know who you are. You're working part-time, full-time. I want you to take that verse as a personal promise. God's not taking you home until you've finished the work he's called you to do. Let me say it again. God's not going to take you home until you've finished the work that he's called you to do. Very important. Those of you that are retired, you don't have a full-time job. Guess what? There's no job description for being retired. Did you know that? There's a few people in this room who are 10 times busier in retirement than they ever were when they're working 40 hours a week or 50 hours a week. I can never get you on the phone. You're always gone. What are you all doing anyway? No matter who I am and where I am, retired or working full time, God has given us a ministry of love, evangelism, sharing with others, ministry to family. Some of you are here because your family still needs you. Remember, we're a seniors congregation. Our age, average age, runs between 96 and about. I know what the low end is. Well, you've got to be 55 to live here or so, something like that. We're all seniors. Some of us well, why am I still here? God has ministry for you till you're done. Amen? Amen? All right, thank you. That's settled. No more arguments on that. Verse 7 and when they had finished their testimony or ministry, the beast, that's the Antichrist, ascends from the bottomless pit, will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually called, that means because they have been in so much sin and depravity, the city is more like Sodom and Egypt than it is like Jerusalem. It's also the city that the Lord was crucified in, verse 9. 
Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to put into, be put into graves. Verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. This is the Antichrist Christmas. They make merry, send gifts to one another. Oh boy, here's a gift for the dead prophet's day. It's disgusting. Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Verse 11. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered into them. And they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Who saw them? The entire earth saw them. It's fun to read commentaries from a hundred years ago. This passage always confused them. How does the whole world see this event taking place? Well, 100 years ago, we didn't have satellite TV. We didn't have 24-7 TV. We didn't have cell phones. All of the instant communications. When we go to war now, you've got reporters on the front lines practically shooting video of what's going on. CNN is covering this event. All the newscasts, they're focusing on these two dead bodies. Everybody's celebrating. Suddenly life comes back into them. And they stand up. Fear goes all over the world. Verse 12. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, I like verse 13. My view of verse 13 on those who, remember, at the, end, at the, the sixth trumpet, the entire world rejects the Messiah based on what's going on with all of the plagues and all of the things that are going on. Remember, I started off with Romans 11 and saying that this is a chapter that lifts up the fact that all of Israel will be saved. I believe that verse 13, when it says, the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven, I believe that's a salva salvation identifier for the rest of the Jews who are still left alive that haven't received their Messiah. This is when they have their last chance and many receive Jesus as their Messiah. From here on out, God's grace begins to be lifted and his full judgment is exercised on the earth. Let me close with tying this together. With what's going on now in the world. There are so many indicators. <laughs> of the coming of the Lord coming back. I can't even get into them. He's coming back soon, right? Acts 1.8 says... But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. In chapter 2, when they're gathered together in the upper room, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together and suddenly there came from heaven like a noise, like a violent rushing wind. And it was filled the whole house where they're sitting. And there appeared upon them tongues of fire. Now I love this. I don't, I can't open my mouth and bring fire out on people 
and see them fried into toast toasties, okay? But God has given me a fire. He's given you a fire. If you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will have power to be my witnesses. Maybe not the same power that these two witnesses in Revelation 11 have. But you have a taste of that power to bring the gospel message, to turn people's hearts to Jesus. It's not by your power or your might. Zechariah 4, 8. But by his spirit in you. It's not your wonderful teaching and understanding and your charismatic personality that brings people to Jesus. It's a power of the Holy Spirit within you that does that. God has fire and power for you today. For those of, that, of us that have already been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we need a renewing of that in this time to go forth. Amen? Don't know whether you sound that convinced or not. Some of you want this kind of power. You got to feel people you'd like to send some fire to. I'm going to encourage you the fire they need is the love and the power of the Holy Spirit, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? Father, thank you for this message. Thank you that all of Israel will be saved. Thank you that everyone who loves you and has received you as Lord and Savior will be saved, either here or in the future. Lord, I pray that you would cause a revival in your church, a revival in my own heart. If you're here this morning or the sound of my voice, you've never received Jesus as your Savior, I encourage you to open your heart. Repent of your sin. Repent of your sin. And say, oh Lord Jesus, I need you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Let him take your sin, give you his righteousness. And give you the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift from the Father. Lord, we open our hearts to salvation and the moving of your Holy Spirit right now in our congregation. Your Spirit flow through us. There's so many people that, Lord, we don't know how to witness to them, but not by my might, not by my understanding, not by my power. The same power that you energize these two revelation witnesses, that same power in the spirit you give to all who would ask for it. Would you ask for it with me today? Lord, I ask for that power of your spirit that by witness be anointed in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, hallelujah. Let's stand together.